Yeah, already. Welcome in to the fifth dimension. Gaining authentic choice and power. A monologue with your host, Evan McDermott. And we are on the air. I want to welcome everybody in to this pilot episode of the Fifth Dimension Podcast, where we are trying to evolve humanity, evolve our consciousness to simply live a better life. Ultimately, when we're looking at the human condition, there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of hate out there in the world. The goal of this podcast is to create a community where we can forget about what's bothering us for a little while. And we can come in, hear some different perspectives on how to live a better life, how to be more mindful in our actions, how to be more aware and in the moment, here and now. I'm your host, Evan McDermott. I want to thank you guys for coming in today, for listening, for whatever reason that you're listening. Maybe you know me personally, you're interested in what I'm doing as a creative project. Maybe you're interested in exploring the topic of mindfulness, or maybe you just stumbled upon this by accident. Whatever your reason is for tuning in, I want to thank you. I want to thank you quite a lot, and I hope you stay tuned, and I hope that you join us in this journey, in this community, to make the world a better place. Now, I'm going to start off the show by saying right off the bat, I'm no expert on mindfulness. I'm just another guy in the world who's trying to do the best in life. And ultimately, I feel that creating this podcast is sort of a calling for me. I do have background in previously hosting college radio shows and media, but that's not so much what I feel is important. Ultimately, I'm on an inward journey and trying to create the best version of my life for myself and trying to help out others along the way. And how I can help out others is I feel by sharing different perspectives and being there for other people. And with this podcast, creating a community for all of us to come together as one. So you're here for pilot number one. You're here for the first episode. How I'm going to start So I'm going to talk a little bit about my background. How did I end up here? And then we're going to move into the topic of choice and gaining a sense of authentic power into our lives. Now, I've always been somebody who shies away from vulnerability and opening up to other people, even ones who I care about. It takes a lot for me to open up to somebody but I ultimately feel a very important part of this topic and important part of this podcast in general is me being open with all of you so you're willing to feel vulnerable and be open with this community. So I was awakened to the idea of mindfulness a few years ago while I was in college going into my senior year. I went on this mindfulness trip to Costa Rica where I was introduced to topics such as the self and this taking this inner journey in a sense and the ideas of energies and it was all so much information gathering within a span of about two weeks that it was an idea that I decided to pursue further upon my arrival back to the United States and with this I certainly had some mental health struggles along the way I had had bouts of depression and dissociation to get to the point where I am now. And in terms of mental illness, something that I've struggled with and it's becoming oh so prevalent in our society because this idea of the consumer and materialistic culture goes against our innate human nature. We're not meant to be competitively trying to earn a million dollars so that we can become happy. That doesn't bring a true sense of fulfillment. How often do you hear about millionaires, billionaires living without what they feel is purpose and without a sense of true happiness? Ultimately, a lot of the indigenous cultures 
and in my belief in Native Americans they they had it right we are one with the earth we are one with each other we shouldn't be exploiting the land as a resource we should be coming together on it as one there's enough people on this planet there's seven billion we have enough food to feed 10 billion why are we not doing that because of economic capital we're going to dive into topics such as that hunger poverty along the way on this journey i have many out uh, episodes outlined and i've done plenty of research on these subjects to bring you guys informed facts but also my opinion on how we can move forward as society so there's going to be a lot of truth bombs if you want to call it that on this show and certainly when we get into what the mainstream might call conspiracy sure but the ones in power have no sense to change it simply because they're living off of wealth those who are in a position of privilege like myself and have awakened to what the real world is about feel a sense of calling to spread this information which is why the podcast is here which is why i'm bringing it to you guys ultimately money does not matter we're living in a world that is false in the sense of what we're supposed to pursue as someone who works as a teacher our education system flawed we're not teaching our kids to be happy we're teaching them how to go to college, get a job, pass tests, live in stress. But what are we doing to get rid of that stress? Certainly we can find fulfillment within ourselves and we can find our callings and we can live lives that are meaningful despite everything that the civilization, in particular Western civilization, has built us up to at this point. There's no escaping the Western world as it is right now, but we need to find a way to evolve into a better planet. So how do we do this? This is bringing me into the idea of choice and authentic power. As I was saying, who benefits from our current power structure? When we think of the word power, a lot of times we think about the evil powers in the world holding control of capital, holding control of government and economic systems, and having this control ultimately impacts everything in our lives. Science, particular science projects are, and research is funded by, let's say, pharmaceutical corporations. So alternative medicines such as psychedelics are not going to be researched as heavily. Uh, we're not going to come up with mindful solutions to global problems because we're so stuck in our current power structures that are funding them. Ultimately, they're not doing anything to make long-term benefit they're doing for short-term gain so we need to evolve out of this and gain a sense of individual authentic power and it has to be done at the individual level and the more we do this at the individual level is when we start seeing a global societal impact and it's starting to happen now how can we do this i call authentic power the alignment of the personality and the soul uh, I got that from Gary Zukav. Uh, he's an excellent author. He's been appeared on Oprah. He's a great, great spiritual, I would call him a guru in a sense. He may not call himself that. Everyone is very hesitant to call themselves gurus. We're all each other's gurus in a sense. We can all learn from each other. But I would encourage you guys to check out Gary Zukav's work. Authentic power, the alignment of the personality and the soul. All right. And we need to evolve out of this idea that we're only five sensory humans. You know, five senses, sight, smell, touch, taste, etc. We have capabilities beyond that. It's estimated we have over 20 to 30 different sensory perceptions, many of them that we're not even aware of. Just another example I can give you is balance. That's a per sensory perception we have, but we don't necessarily think of it as the five senses now, do we? But we need to evolve in this sort of multi sensory human perspective. Ultimately, becoming a multi-sensory human and becoming aware of ourselves, our own personality, our own desires, what calls to us, is the ultimate goal of spiritual growth. And that's what I found brings true fulfillment into my life. Now, 
how do we gain this authentic power? Ultimately, it comes down to our choices and the choices we make, not just on the conscious level, but on the subconscious level. So many of our choices that we're making happen at a subconscious level. And society programs so many ideas into our brain from a very, very young age. The inner child within ourselves gets lost. We become unsure of ourselves, nervous. I myself have dealt with numerous and extensive bouts of self-doubt that I'm still working to overcome today. I have to give myself daily affirmations that I am confident, that I am able to manifest what I want to manifest in my life. I have another podcast upcoming that talks about my daily spiritual practice, and I'll get more into depth on affirmations and the idea of meditation and where that can bring us. But ultimately, choice has the power to make a difference in our life, but it also has the power to continue our lives unchanged. When we're making those subconscious choices to have doubts in ourselves, to be fearful of the world around us, we're ultimately creating an experiment, experience within ourselves that within our world that is unfulfilling. We're not gaining a true sense of fulfillment. Ultimately, we have to apply our will and shift the orientation of ourselves as a victim to a creator. Now, there are certainly going to be things in difficult in life that are difficult to overcome. There's going to be situations that others have gone through that I can't even imagine to have gone through. And it takes tremendous willpower to get over these things. But you have the capability to do it. Everything that has happened in your life has shaped to where you are at this point in time. Is everything that happened to you good? No, absolutely not. There are people out there who do horrific things to good, wonderful people. Everybody has traumas, different extents of traumas. But it's brought you to where you are today. You have survived and gained the perspective that you have because of what you have gone through. Now, how do we begin to shift that orientation? Ultimately, we have plenty of attachment to old beliefs, old ideas about ourselves. We have preconceived notions that kind of create the, our identity. These are buried within our subconscious. There's a few things that I want to go over that I actually took again from Gary Zukov. Um, in his book, The Mind of the Soul. It's a activity that I found particularly useful and I wrote out. So if you guys want to write out this activity I'm about to describe to you, that's great. If not, just think about it. That's all right. I understand many of you may be driving, and in which case, if you're driving, please don't write this out. Multitasking and driving, not a good idea. I learned that from experience. That's a story for another day. But anyways, what is our preconceived notion of identity? Uh, oftentimes in the West in particular, these are some things that come to mind. We have preconceived notions about our nationality, maybe the languages we're speaking, our race, our personal history and background, a sense of style, clothing, maybe you know hair, habits, and another one that Zukov mentions is religion. I'm going to go in depth about each of these for me, and as I go through them, I encourage you guys to listen to my thoughts on it and also try to gain an awareness. How does this impact me? How do I view these topics? So I'm going to start with nationality. Obviously, I was born in America. I, for a long time, had this national pride of patriotism and Americanism. And ultimately... I think this is something that is very much instilled within all of us. And we have even seen a greater rise in nationalism over the years. Now, I'm going to dive into this a little bit more in depth later in this episode in relation to nationalism and corporate power. But I have come to the belief and idea that we are ultimately one human race. Nationalism is a very isol isolation technique old school that is dividing countries with imaginary borders, dividing a human race which ultimately needs to come together to tackle global issues such as climate change, poverty, hunger. Those aren't things that can be solved on a national scale and ultimately our survival of a species and evolution of a species depends on 
globalism and coming together as one because we're not going to solve anything by keeping ourselves apart. So I've lost this sense of identity of, I'm proud to be an American. Am I certainly happy to be living in this country? Certainly. There's a lot less places that I could be living where I would not have the opportunity to even speak about subjects like this. So for that, I'm very grateful for where I am. But we need to lose the sense that you're different than someone in Yemen. What makes you different than that child who is starving over in Congo? Just because you were born to rich, white, wealthy parents who can buy you a car when you're 16, and as opposed to someone who was born in a quote-unquote third world country where they don't have wealth, where they don't have income, where they don't have clean water. It's all luck of the draw. We're all one human race here. And this kind of goes into the next couple points as well. Language. Uh, obviously, I speak English speak a little bit of Spanglish, you know, (laughs) but ultimately I'm born into this English language and we all have an attachment to our language, but it's sort of part of our cultural identity in a sense. Spoken language is just a means of communication. It doesn't necessarily make you different than someone who speaks another language. They are still an embodiment of consciousness. They are still human. I could have born born into any number of different languages or different dialect, and I'm still going to have consciousness. I'm still going to have thoughts. I'm still going to be taking part in this reality on Earth. Now, there are means of universal languages. Let's think about love. You can send someone unconditional love, despite what language they're speaking. Think of music as a more applicable one for many. We can enjoy music let's say an instrumental there's no words but we're all enjoying we're getting that feeling that music invokes so i think you get this the point where i'm going with language here it's simply a means of spoken communication there are universal languages that we need to tap into again this global idea same with race as we're going into what's what's a few pigments it's biologically evolution human evolution how we turned out as humans you know well, if you're born in africa you're going to have darker pigmentation to protect from the sun's uv rays ultimately again we're all embodying this this consciousness as a species we're all humans racism is a philosophical idea to create separation and again if you if you're We have a lot of these preconceived notions about race are engraved in us at such young ages. And it takes a lot of inner work to get over those. But we're getting a lot better with race. But again, we got to keep moving on it. Uh, Personal history, again, something we all naturally get attached to. Uh, I understand what a five sensory mindset, kind of going back to that, only using the five sentences, sentences, because I had that mindset. I understand where I came from and the growth that I've had as an individual to reach the point that I'm at today. Uh, But ultimately, we can't ruminate on the past and live in the past. we got to live in this moment here and now. Our personal history makes us who we are, but it doesn't define who we will be. Uh, Moving into, you know, clothes, hairstyle, I think this is one of the most silly things you can define a person off of. Nobody benefits from being judged on mundane, surface-level things like that. Ultimately, when we're judging others, we're simply pointing out the insecurities within ourselves. So learn to love yourself. You'll learn to love others and not judge things off of clothes and hairstyle. Um, Looking at habits, whether they're good or bad, they sort of feed the previous versions of ourselves. And what we want to do is we want to hone in on those good habits and attempt to get rid of the bad habits we have whether it be addictions or, you know, just negative self-thoughts, things such as that. And we're going to break on that on occasion, but what's ultimately important is when you do, reflect and attempt to do better the next time and use willpower so that eventually you're going into the subconscious to enforce good habits. And then lastly, religion. I think this is a, a large concept and we can do a whole show just on the ideas of religion, but... I did not grow up in a religious household, which I'm thankful for, but I do believe in this universal power and universal energy that is in all of us. Ultimately, 
Every religion you look at in history has been founded off the same basic principles of unity and oneness and coming together and living in a society that embraces love and tolerance. And over the years, we look at Christianity, we look at Islam, we look at Judaism. Every religion has skewed from its original principles. Jesus, the Buddha, uh, Muhammad, all these individuals were enlightened beings who had these great principles of unity and they understood what life was about. It's about helping others. It's about living in a world of love. And when we look at religion now, more people have died in the name of the Lord, quote unquote, than any natural disaster, diseases, gang wars, everything. So religion has really skewed over the years. If you have an attachment to your religion, I would encourage you to take a hard look at it. And how does that, how does it benefit you? What moral principles? I think there are certainly great moral principles that religion can bring us and give us fulfillment in a sense. But religion today also enforces a lot of separation and division. So I would encourage you guys to see how does your religion impact yourself and how does it impact others around you? So those are just some preconceived notions of identity that I have found in my life. And ultimately, like I was saying, we have the choice of how we are perceiving ourselves, how we go about and seeing the world. We need to see and make choices that realize we're neither inferior or superior to other beings. I guarantee you. Even if it appears someone isn't trying or even if someone is mean to others, if you got to know anybody well enough, you would begin to see their vulnerabilities and where these things stem from, because ultimately we are all human. We are doing our best to the of the ability that we know how to. So saying with our upbringings, with our past, everything has been modeled to us. We learn behaviors through other human beings. So, and this, this can get into the idea of forgiveness and the need for forgiving everybody. I have a podcast coming out specifically about forgiveness, so I'm not going to jump too heavily into that as of at this moment. Now, as I was saying, authentic personal power comes through choice, and there are ultimately three main choices that we can make in this world that are going to define how we live. First one, how we perceive ourselves Again, that goes back to the notion of identity. That goes back to how we're seeing ourselves. Are we viewing ourselves as confident beings who can achieve anything we want in life? Or are we having that victim mindset where life is happening to us? And so many of us are living in that mindset, maybe even subconsciously. That life is happening to us. We're just going to ride the storm, essentially. That's the Western idea. That is what has been in, instilled into all of us. We have the choice. We don't have to let life happens to us. We have the choice. Uh, the second one, how do we view, how, what is our relationship to others? How are we viewing others? Are we judging or are we trying to love all beings? And third is the interconnection between the two and how we view the world around us. Ultimately, how you're going to perceive others and how you're going to treat others in the world around you is ultimately revolving around how you're going to be treating yourself. If you're on an inner quest of self-love and you're attempting to give yourself love, you will go into the world in a more loving embodiment and ultimately find more loving experiences. The choices you make about yourself will impact not just you, but those around you as well. And ultimately, by making these choices, by gaining this authentic power, you're getting multi-sensory tendencies and a multi-sensory perception beyond just the five sentences. Senten senses, sorry, I'm trying to have trouble speaking English on occasion. But this multi-sensory perception brings with it the new potential of an authentically empowered human species. And an authentically empowered human species is what can begin to tackle global issues, begin to take down existing power structures, because we need to look at things from a different angle. Ultimately, we need modern ideas for a modern world. The ideas that we have now, I'm going to get into certain political systems in a minute too. They're all old ideas. So 
that being said, uh, this next bit is going to get a little bit political in a sense. With mindfulness, we want to make mindfulness as apolitical as possible. Ultimately, we want, whether you're left-wing, right-wing, you know, anarchist, whatever, anybody should be able to get the benefits of mindfulness and going on the inner quest to better help themselves. This is something that is a human thing, not a political thing, and that's why I don't even label myself as a political being in a sense. I certainly follow political issues and I follow the modern day events that are going on, but that's so I can have a greater understanding of the world around me. Mindfulness brings us into direct contact with our own values, with our own desires, and we want to begin to create a better world. Aristotle said long ago, human beings are political animals. Ultimately, a lot of times our politics stem from the ideas we have about ourselves, the ideas we have about others. And by working on yourself, you're going to create a political ideology in a sense that is more compassionate and more loving. So as I was saying, our current power structures, they're centered around nationalism and corporations and the idea of capital. Um, with this, you create these extreme imbalances. You have billionaires and millionaires on one side essentially running in the world. And you have this extreme poverty on the other side where you have cycles of maybe crime that just keeps repeating itself or people who are hungry who have no chance to escape that. You certainly have the individual success stories, but that's not happening to most people. There's a reason we highlight those individual success stories. And we've been made to believe that this is just normal. This is how humanity works. Well, guess what? It's not. And so many of our just, us are just caught in the middle. Let's look at the movie The Joker, for example. Um, I think why it's causing such an uproar is you have this wealthy billionaire class, Thomas Wayne, for example, who's trying to run. And it's the same thing if you're looking at the rise of Donald Trump. So many people feel caught in the middle and they want this change. They want to latch on to these extreme ideologies and embrace the inner shadow self. And people are getting fed up and resorting to that shadow of violence because there's ultimately they feel there's no other way. This sort of rise of fascism. And when you look at fascism from a historical standpoint, fascists don't think they're fascists. They think they're doing what is right for themselves and what is right for the world. But with that, there's no necessarily global perspective or sense. So ultimately, that's why I think the debate on left versus right, it's irrelevant. It's not going to solve any global issues. I myself voted for Gary Johnson in the 2016 election. And part of me, I wasn't on this inner journey, but I didn't believe in the, the two-party systems. I was kind of rebelling against that. But now I see that system is just irrelevant in itself. And we need to start looking at things from a global perspective. As I was saying, poverty, war, climate change. We can't attach this to our current political systems because to tackle it, we need a global approach. So... Globalism is the way of the future. Nationalism is just a division among people who are ultimately all the same, right? We look at this immigration problem we're having in the United States and people running over the Mexican border and we need to build a wall. What makes you any different than the person who's fleeing a country that is stricken by violence and crime and war? simply trying to flee to make a better life for themselves. Ultimately, in order to unroot our current power structures, we need to go back to gaining this personal fulfillment through growth, through mindfulness, getting an authentic power and having an authentic multi-sensory perception, which is going to empower us as a species. Let's look at People who are at the very, very bottom, right? People who are in extreme poverty. Just looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if your physiological needs are not met, you're not even going to get to the point of trying to better oneself. You're just trying to survive. You're trying to have a shelter. You're trying to have food. You're trying to have drinkable water. You don't, certainly there might be uprising, but 
In order to unroot these power structures, and we see it so often with the toppling of dictators, just the cycle repeating itself, we don't know how to unroot it to the degree of creating an authentic human power structure, an authentic society that shifts away from this capitalistic ideal and truly bringing about equality and peace among others. To solve the issues of war, poverty, climate change, we have to switch it up. We can't become complacent and seek comforts to sort of wash away our own pains, fears, and insecurities because we're all facing these in the current lives we're living in, in the current society we're living in. Our society is enforcing us that we're not good enough and we should be divided just look at our political system. Look at all of the microcosms of our society, our education system, our government, our workplace environments. Those are all examples of what our society is like on the larger scale. Look at our prison system, for example. I'm going to talk more in depth about this in, our forgiv in the Forgiveness podcast, but... If our society was truly about second chances and reconciliation, we wouldn't have a prison system based on discipline and punishment. Just a thought. But with mindfulness, we can choose how we are going to react, how we are going to respond, what our perceptions are, and what is our way of life. How are we going to choose how to live? Ultimately, corporate power and the power structures we're living in now their interests rely on money and not people and this is all over the world we are seeing a rise in global trade and global economy but it's in the capitalistic sense you know we see oil the fight for oils and the wars for oil people killing just to gain control economically over a region the United States itself has uh, toppled 59 countries' power structures, over trying to overthrow 59 different countries since World War II. 36 of those times have been successful. I mean, we even look at George W. Bush, Tony Blair, British Prime Minister uh, for the Iraq War. They were convicted of war crimes by an independent war crimes commission, the Kuala Lumpur. A lot of people will say, oh, well, they don't matter. It's an independent commission. The reason that they were convicted by the independent commission and not United Nations is because if United Nations started going after people like George W. Bush, they would have to go after every president we've ever had because they're all committing war crimes nowadays. It's all about capital. It's not about people. In order to make it about people, we need the majority of the population to understand this and awaken to this and attempt to live in a world where they're helping others and also helping themselves. And ultimately, if we're going to survive as a species, we need to gain this consciousness, this awareness. Earth is not a resource. Earth is live like you and I. It creates life. We are a universal embodiment of Earth and the universe itself. Billionaires, they should not exist. But what incentive do they have to change what's going on? Capitalism, communism, socialism, all of these ideas revolve around capital. They're all outdated. Capitalism, 16th century. Uh, Communist Manifesto, 1840. These are all old, outdated ideas. They don't belong in a modern society. As I said earlier, we need modern ideas for a modern world. So that's what this podcast is about. Now, I touched on a lot of subjects within there. Many of them would be controversial if you're looking at it from the idea that humanity as it is right now is how it's supposed to be. But when you take a step back and you look at how our system 
of society was created. The shaping of hundreds and hundreds of years in the making. There was a point where humans did not exist as we're existing right now. I mean, imagine we can go to John Lennon's song. So many people think they can live by that, right? But can you truly, can you truly imagine a world without religion? Can you truly imagine a world without countries and possessions? We're all living as one and helping each other. It's going to take a global shift in perspective. Is this going to happen in our lifetimes? My guess is probably not. But we got to start planting the seeds because if we don't, humans as a species will cease to exist because we didn't evolve appropriately on, on the planet as we were meant to. So many of our Western technological advancements, they've been great in the sense that because of these advancements, we have the ability to live our lives in a meaningful manner and have all this access and resources to us to, you know, feed 7 billion people on the planet and have 7 billion people living on it in a great mindful lifestyle. We have the resources to make that happen. We just have to evolve into it. Otherwise, the imbalances are going to creep getting 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 better, greater, and humans are going to cease to exist. Someone will blow up the planet or famine will strike and there'll be global uprising. We got to start being more mindfully aware. We have to start taking care of our planet. And we have to start doing that now. Now, next part of our show, we're almost towards the end here on our first pilot episode. The length of each episode is really going to depend on the topic. A lot of the interviews that I do are probably going to go a little bit longer than just monologues because there's only so much I can say. I mean, I don't think you want to listen to my voice for two hours straight. I mean, if you do, great. I love that. Um, but, you know, each each episode is going to be different in terms of length. But one thing I like to do is have a question section where you, the listener, can ask me questions or ask specific guest questions, and I give you answers to it. Now, I'm going to give a couple mindfulness frequently asked questions and just give my quick perspective on it. And then afterwards, I'll tell you guys how you can support the show, and you can go and check out more of our episodes afterwards. So... One frequently asked question, just what is mindfulness? Now, mindfulness is something that sounds very simple, but also something very complex. All it really is, I view mindfulness, is being aware in the moment. Now, as I said, it sounds simple, but it's not something that we do consciously often. A lot of times we're living on autopilot. We're living in the mind. First time I mentioned that phrase, I find myself living in the mind to a family member. They didn't have any understanding as to what that concept meant. So when you're living on the mind, you're thinking in terms of, let's say you're driving. A lot of times if you're driving, you might have music on or something, but your mind's just going. You're thinking about the day ahead or you're thinking about what you've already done today or what your schedule's like. Mindfulness is just being aware of what you're doing in the here and in the now. What do you have sitting next to you? Maybe you've got a water bottle or maybe you have a pen or maybe just find an object directly near you. Maybe you're driving. Just use some of your senses to truly embrace all that object is. How does it feel? How does it look? What intricate details about it do you notice now that you're paying extra attention to it? And that's just a very small scale example of being mindful. But when you go into the world like that with that mindset of truly paying attention and truly being in the moment that's when you can begin to respond to situations how you want to ultimately again uh, kind of going into the next question maybe some misconceptions about mindfulness mindfulness isn't about living a constant stress-free life i practice mindfulness every day but i still have stressors that i deal with i still have things that you know terrify me but 
being mindful means how am I responding to this? How am I reflecting upon it? And how am I going to try and do better in the future? How am I going to try and live my life in the here and now and make the best of each day? You know, you're going to have days where it seems everything goes wrong. But those are the days that make us truly appreciate those really great days, right? So maybe being mindful, you're not going to bed every night and saying, this was the best day of my life. It's certainly going to happen more often if you're more mindful. But you go to bed thinking, okay, I really can reflect on what happened today. And tomorrow, based on what happened today, I'm going to, again, be in the moment and I'm going to choose to respond this way as opposed to what I did today. Or and you can really you can really reflect on the world around you. And another misconception that I find about mindfulness is it's almost become a buzzword in a sense, but this isn't a new idea. Mindfulness, whether it's been through yoga, meditation, this has been around for thousands of years. Living in the moment, living in the here and now is a concept that's been around for as long as humans have been around, as long as humans have been in this civilized world. It stems a lot from Eastern philosophies and ancient India in particular. Uh, yoga was around thousands of years ago then. And it's starting to make a comeback, I feel, because we're living in such a consumer, materialistic world where we're beginning to wake up to the realization that everything around us is not how it's supposed to be. It's kind of fake. So more and more people are starting to become aware of it in practicing self-love and self-care because we have to. There's no other way to live. And lastly, I'm going to do for frequently asked questions today, how can I begin mindfulness? Again, it's just starting by being totally aware of your surroundings, your feelings. Maybe think about what is it that is going on today? What is it going on in my head? What are my thoughts like? What are my thought patterns? How do I view myself? Kind of talking about this idea of who we are, getting to know yourself better. There's a big difference between loneliness and solidarity. Solidarity is peaceful, comfortable within ourselves. But so many people nowadays, any alone time means loneliness. And we're afraid of our true selves. We're afraid of being on our own. We need to start learning to embrace solidarity, and that comes through practicing self-love, mindfulness. Uh, I would also say, try, start trying meditation. Just sitting still for five minutes, five minutes, noticing the breath. Ultimately, the breath is what's connecting our mind and body, and the body can really ground us in the physical world around us, right? So just noticing, being present, focusing on your breath for five minutes, see what comes up. With meditation, a lot of people will try it and then not do it again because they're going, oh, I'm thinking. I don't like this. I'm never going to be able to get good at this. Thoughts are a part of meditation. Every meditation session is different. And you will have thoughts in almost every meditation you do, but it's about noticing them and saying, oh, I just had that thought. I'm going to go back to focusing on my breath now. And just being aware. Not even thinking about being aware, just being aware, just doing it, just trying it. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you get doing it, and the more comfortable you get with yourself. I myself have gone through that self-hatred phase. I've seen what it can do to you and what it can do to your mental health. And through meditation, I've been able to really get comfortable on my own, really get comfortable by myself. So I encourage you guys to really try it out. Give it a chance. There's a whole bunch of different guided meditations that I think you can find the right one for you, especially on YouTube. If anyone wants meditation recommendations um, and maybe you have specific needs or things that you want to meet within meditation, I can definitely help you guys out. Just feel free to shoot me a message and I'm happy to recommend any sort of meditation or mindfulness practice for you guys. So that'll about do it for this episode. Uh, what I'm going to do now, just tell you guys how you can support the show. Ultimately, it does cost money for me to keep this show running. 
um, but I'm never going to have any sort of advertisements or corporate ads on here. I don't really do this for profit, but there is a Patreon. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash the fifth dimension. And if you choose to donate on there, it's donate what you can. There's no tier levels. I know Patreon encourages like donate $5, you get this much, donate $10, you get this much, but whatever you donate, you'll just get early access and sort of a mini blog on there and we can comment and interact and it'll be a place for uh, interaction. Um, if you don't choose to go on Patreon, though, that's fine as well. However you're choosing to listen to this, if you're on Apple Podcasts, for example, you know, just give this podcast a rating. Maybe I prefer five stars, <laughs> but give it a rating. Tell us what you think. Ultimately, your feedback is what generates this podcast. Uh, the goal is to get in new and noteworthy so we can gain a larger following and truly help people around the world. Um, that's really my goal with this podcast. I just want to help people express some views, express different perspectives, get people thinking about themselves and what can they do for themselves today. So rate the podcast, check us out on Instagram, uh, at the fifth dimension podcast, very engaged on there. That's the only social media we have. Uh, we're not, I don't have time to run a million different Instagram account or social media accounts, excuse me. Um, but pretty active on Instagram, or you can also check out my personal Instagram at Evan McDermott. Um, other than that, that's going to wrap this episode up. So if anyone has any questions or wants to reach out to me, you can reach me on Instagram, Patreon, wherever you want to go to find me. I am very responsive and happy to answer any questions. Or if you want to come on the show, talk about a specific topic, just let me know. I'm always open to great discussions with great, beautiful people. All right. Thank you all for listening. Check out our other episodes that were released at the same time as this one. Uh, we're going to have at least one episode every week from here on out coming out. So uh, I'm excited to have this journey with you guys and continue down this mindful road. So long, everybody. Take care. Giving Thanks. The Fifth Dimension Podcast wants to give thanks to the following people. Clark Silva for designing our podcast logo. Find him on Instagram, Art of Clark Silva. He's got some great work, let me tell you. Thank you, August Tucker, also known as Roundtree. Check him out. Uh, he created the intro. He created the song you're listening to right now. He is the official man behind the music of the Fifth Dimension Podcast. And lastly, I want to thank you, the listener. One, for making it this far. Two, for being engaged on the inward journey. You got this? This show would not be running without you. Stay tuned. We got plenty more coming. So long. <laughs>